Well, thank you everybody for uh, coming here tonight. Thank you, Melissa, for uh, facilitating uh, our uh, space here at the Miller Center tonight. Um, and thank you, Town Hall Meeting at uh, On Meeting TV for uh, for covering us. Um, we there is not really a, like a formal agenda. Uh, we just mostly want to talk about the, the ballot questions, answer any questions, uh, raise any concerns. Uh, I know there's a couple of speakers here tonight, but if you also want to get on the stack, if you want to present, please feel free. Um, it's everybody, I feel like everybody mostly are on the same like chapter at least, like in terms of the um, the ballot questions. Uh, if not, so raise your concerns or questions, uh, and also. Um, it would be great to hear from people, people who live here, like how we can have a bigger presence um, and just kind of pack strategy of, of uh, going into town meeting day, uh, how we can, we can win, uh, especially the petition-backed uh, ballot questions. Um, but I know there's like some concerns about the other questions that uh, number two, I believe, was uh, uh, the one that Nick will be speaking about. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, Nick and uh, turn it over. Can I make one request slash yeah. suggestion? Yeah. Um, as I think one thing that would be helpful, because we've been hearing like a lot of great presentations, I think a really good use of time could be with um, the uh, police oversight board yeah. specifically to address um, some of the frequent and common uh, yes. misconceptions yeah. could be a great use of time. Yes, I also have like some updates about that that, we, that I will share. I just spoke to a the uh, the former chair now uh, Jabu uh, Jabulani, who's uh, I, I spoke to, and there's like actually some information I did not know before that I would like to share with the group. So, uh, but uh, number two first. Thank you, Farid. Hi, I'm Nick Persampieri. Can you all hear me through this mask? Great. That's for the recording. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I live in Burlington near downtown. And I've been working with a group called Stop Vermont Biomass. And we're an informal group that's just come together recently. We're really committed to doing something about climate change. We're also concerned about air pollution, public health generally, as well as the protection of our forests and the biodiversity of our forests. And I'm here tonight to ask you to vote no on question number two on the town meeting day ballot. That question is about what's called a carbon impact fee. And when, if you read the question, it sounds like a really good thing that you might consider supporting. It asks you to allow the city to impose a fee on fossil fuel heating systems. And the fee would be imposed on fossil fuel heating systems installed in new construction, as well as in existing large commercial and industrial buildings when they replace their heating systems with a fossil fuel system. So it sounds like something that's good because as we all know, burning fossil fuels is really bad for climate change. It's polluting. But the problem is um, the, the question as framed is misleading. It says that we will impose a fee on fossil fuel heating systems and not on renewable systems. Again, that sounds good, but they don't tell you in the question what the city considers to be renewable. And there are three different types of heating that the city considers to be renewable that will not be subject to, fee, to the fee and all three of those are bad for the climate and for public health and for our forests. Those three types of heating systems are biomass, so heating based on burning wood, biofuels, and also something called renewable natural gas. 
burning biomass for heating is horrific from a climate standpoint, especially if you're doing it to generate electricity. Burning wood puts more carbon dioxide into the air per unit of power generated than burning any fossil fuel, including coal. Burlington Electric considers burning wood to be carbon neutral, but that's just flat wrong. You know, they claim that it's carbon neutral because although you're putting CO2 into the air, the trees that you cut down and burn will eventually regrow and, and absorb the carbon that you've put into the air. The problem is that that takes many years on the order of 70 to more than 100 years for the tree regrowth to make up for the CO2 that's going into the air. So that we just don't have that much time to save our climate. It, burning wood is also done in pellet stoves and we don't want to be incentivizing that either because it's it's bad from an air quality standpoint it's bad from an indoor air quality standpoint the american lung association recommends that you avoid using a pellet stove for heating and biofuels are problematic because again, burning them generates fossil fuels, generates greenhouse gases, and it's also responsible for, uh, display for displacing land that's used for crop production. Renewable natural gas is gas that is, that is collected from landfills and from farms and it's the same thing basically as natural gas, it's methane. So that also has climate impacts and it's polluting when you generate it and burn it for heat. Fareed, do you have a question? So what happens if we vote no? Will they have to go back and to the, and to the drawing board and present a new plan? Like what's the, what's the consequence of like us voting no? Or if, that, if, we, if we actually get rejected by voters? So if this is rejected, then there won't be any fee placed on fossil fuel heating systems. And the city does have an ordinance in place that requires primary heating systems to be renewable. So that would still be on the so books. So the status quo is preferable to what, what's being proposed? So the status quo is not good either. <laughs> okay. Um, because there's an ordinance in place that requires these so-called renewable systems to be used in new construction. And again, these renewable systems, the so-called renewable systems are not good. So regardless, so we need to get that ordinance changed. And that's something that we plan to work on. Yeah. So an ordinance change like doesn't require the charter change to no. a this, this, like the, the one being proposed right now does, okay. Right. And so the problem with um, putting a fee on fossil fuel heating systems, but not on these so-called renewable false climate solutions is that you're incentivizing those false climate solutions and that's not a good thing. So for those reasons, I ask you to vote no on question number two. And uh, any website we should, uh, we should check out or how do we get more information? We do have a website. Um, I have some materials I can distribute to you does anyone have any questions? I would say stop btvbiomass.org. Okay. And right. Dan Castragano is working with us. He lives in the neighborhood here. Can, can you tell us or explain 
what happens to biomass that's created relatively recently, in other words, not that's created a, a million years ago, what happens to that biomass if it's not burned? What happens to the carbon in it if it's not burned? Well, it depends what type of vegetation you're talking about. Trees. Any vegetation. Well, and trees old, uh, grow to be very old, and the older they are, the more carbon they absorb. Yeah, and then when the tree dies, and a very small percentage of that tree is very small percentage is sequestered and, and will in a million years become some oil or some coal or some kind of fossil fuel for somebody a million years from now. We don't have a million but years. what happens to the 99%, 99.99% of that tree that isn't sequestered? What happens to the carbon in that tree when it dies and when it decays? Well, some of it goes into the atmosphere. All but, of it does. But that happens over many, many years. And if you cut right. the trees but down now, just, it goes I, into the air now rather than, than at the end of the tree's lifespan. I, I just want to point out what, what is um, the fundamental difference, what the, the fundamental problem with carbon uh, you know, our CO2 problem, the, the, the 359 or whatever that thing, the 350 parts per million thing, is that over millions of years in the regular life uh, cycle on the planet, and there's all this carbon and the dinosaurs, whatever, they're dying, their, their carcasses decay, almost all of it goes right back into the atmosphere. But over millions of years, this tiny, tiny little percentage of that carbon didn't go back in the atmosphere, and it got sequestered and buried, and more buried and more buried on top. Then it gets compressed and you, you know turns into uh, shale and coal, and it gets compressed more. Eventually, becomes oil. Um, what we're doing in 200 years, since like 1800 or even 1750, what we're doing is we're releasing into the atmosphere carbon that was sequestered over millions and millions of years, suddenly over a 200-year period, and that's causing us our problem. But burning wood from the forest is not. It is six of one, half a dozen of another. Burning wood from the forest is going to return the same carbon to the air that the wood rotting would return to the air. And Except it does it much more quickly. No, but but no, it's it's, it's a it's a uh, it's a steady state system. There is a everybody it, it returns it right away. But what difference does it make if you're returning all this carbon in the air in this hour, and then over the many years the same wood, same exact wood, would return that carbon to the air anyway, along with all this other wood. It is in the it is in the net scheme the same. It's the same amount of carbon that goes into the air. <coughs> yeah, we got to we got to move move on. Okay, but yeah. it's a technical yeah. issue. So. Well, you know, your view is contrary to the latest scientific yeah. thinking. Well, actually, so, I'm an electrical engineer with a PhD. All, that's all I'll say. So, I know I know energy systems, right. and I understand so, this Robert, very you say very something? well. We got until 7:30. You, you wanted to say something about RCV? Oh, well, thank you, you Nick. To, I, yeah. I don't know. I don't want to get in an argument again. Okay. Well, <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to vote on two. Yeah. Okay. So I was like, okay. okay. I don't so, know how I'm going to vote right, on two. Three minutes. Uh, yeah. Until 7.30, because we okay. have 7.30. Okay, uh, should I, should, in three minutes? Okay, so um, I, I will, I will, I would like, I would like material. Uh, um, I, I can't even tell you how to vote on question six, which is the RCV question. Um, I don't even know how I'm going to vote on it. I am somebody who is in favor of ranked choice voting, but I want it done right. And uh, we have a special history here in Burlington about it uh, because we've had ranked choice voting about uh, 14 years ago and, and, and 17 years ago. And, uh, um, and something happened, an anomaly happened, uh, uh, which is actually kind of historical because this anomaly has happened only in Burlington in 2009 and then it happened again in Alaska last August in 2022. And, um, but I, I don't want to get into the nitty-gritty details about that. I just want to say that the, the 
organizations promoting ranked choice voting, and they, they have names. Their name is Fair Vote, and the other one is VPIRG. Um, they are in marketing mode. They are not in product development mode. They will not be completely honest with you and honest with themselves about problems when they come up, and they will downplay them as best as they can. Turns out FairVote has a competitive organization called the Center for Election Sciences, and they promote, they have a product though. They're trying to sell approval voting, and Fargo, North Dakota, and St. Louis, Missouri adopted that. And it's different than ranked choice voting. It also has problems. They also won't be honest about their product. But um, there are scholars that are trying to be honest about ranked choice voting, what is important about it, what can be done right, and what isn't. And I've been interfacing with them, and I'm the only Burlington resident that isn't it. So they kind of like me because I'm here in this city where this historical failure of instant runoff voting happened. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm not going to go into the details of that. We don't have time. There's one other issue, and it has to do with process transparency in elections. For, as somebody who's worked in elections, and uh, we have other folks that have worked in elections, um, one of the most important things that happens at the end of a, uh, an election day is when the last person votes, they put their ballot in the machine, and then they're done, and then we press a button on the machine, we do something, and the machine prints out a ticker tape with the vote totals for that polling place. And those vote totals we post in the back of the room, right over there. And candidates come in, the media comes in, they look at those vote totals that are on the ticker tape, and they can add them to the corresponding vote totals from other polling places, like Ward 4, Ward 3. Like if it, if, if it was a, a state race that transcended more than one ward, you can add those numbers together and you can know who wins. You lose that with this wrong way of doing ranked choice voting, the way that they're promoting. You, if, you, if somebody does not win in the first round, then it goes into opaquely, the ballots are transported opaquely to the central tabulation location, that's City Hall in our case, but if ranked choice voting goes statewide, it's gonna be Montpelier, and you might have noticed in Alaska, when they've had ranked choice voting just this last November, they didn't announce results until the day before Thanksgiving. It took them 15 days to announce results. And there's a reason for that. You have to centralize the vote. Even though computers are fast, you still got to get all the ballot data securely transported. And it's, it's maybe securely transported, but not opaque or not transparently. It's opaquely transported. We don't know what's going on until they announce it's all a central place. There's no double checking of the results. And the reason why this is important is, and I will quote this abomination, uh, I'd just like to find uh, 11,780 uh, votes. Now, what if that Secretary of State in Georgia was corrupt? Oh, we'll add a few votes into this pile and add a few votes into this other city and add a few votes and they might f dig up 11,000 votes for Donald Trump. But they can't do that if you post the results, you publish them at each polling location on election night. And we will lose that with the wrong kind of ranked choice voting, which is what's coming. But the state, the state legislature pulled out the type of ranked choice voting out of the current charter change that we have now for the city councilors, and they will again. And I am, I'm, I'm taking my fight to the state house. And so I don't even know how to vote on, on, on number six. That was gonna be my question. Yeah. I, 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 don't, I, I might vote yay for it. I'm actually yeah, for ranked choice voting, but I want to Yeah, you know. And I don't want people to lie about it, and that's what happened in City Hall uh, when Jack Hansen reintroduced it. Can can you leave your contact information uh, so okay. people who have um, questions can uh, well, can get in I'm touch be, with you? I'm be here in the NPA okay. Next yeah, they won't let other people from other NPA come here. Though right. they're not very friendly. Um, My name is Robert <laughs> they're not. <laughs> they ban me. Find me on Google. Yeah. Well, yeah. No. I mean, actually, like I grew up in a country where it's so efficient. We know the result of the election six months in advance. <laughs> Ooh, that's, that's a problem. Efficiency, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. So let's uh, uh, we uh, we're a little behind time here. Um, 
I want to open it up for, is Taylor still here? Tyler? Oh, yeah. So we got question seven and question eight. Uh, anybody know? Is anybody voting no on this thing? Like, let's hear, let's hear uh, the, no, the no voters. <laughs> so number seven is the community control of the police, uh, independent community oversight. Um, and and I don't know, Martha. You like you live here. Like I want to I want to hear what your neighbors, what you're hearing from your neighbors, uh, or folks who live here. Like it's I. I yeah, well, I mean, I <laughs> like, they banned me from the Facebook group because I don't live here, um, and they and me too. yeah, and I don't. You know what? It's like my in my my neighborhood is pretty bad. Like I'm in Ward Five, and it's so hard to talk to people about uh, either either of this number seven or number eight. Everybody wants the police, more police, and um, people even who were like who did not like uh, the Burlington police, they got broken into and they just flip right away. <laughs> it's like my house was broken into. I'm now gonna like vote no on like number seven. Um, so I would be interested in like hearing what like what folks ha uh, here, who live here have to say, um, or what they, your neighbors are are, are are saying that we we particularly should address. Um, well, you know, I don't, I can't speak for anyone um, really but myself, but I know a lot of people are against it. I happen to be for it, and it's because I've seen it all the way from the very beginning and the development, and I've watched the police commission struggle and get stronger, but not have the authority to make changes and not get listened to. I've seen the police get more outrageous and they think they're, they're getting slicker, but you know, you, not really. And, um, and honestly, I do not trust the city. So I think the community needs to have the larger role, but maybe another um, Ward 7 or Ward 4 resident could tell you what their neighbors say, but most of mine don't really get the, the need for this and they don't get um, the, the complicated history of it and they they get the big voice from the status quo the police and the mayor saying and and the city council for uh <laughs> to a great extent saying oh no that that's terrible we you, you don't want that so yeah. that's it, it's tricky i gotta say by one thing that um, that i found uh, actually changed people's mind was uh this last like scandal with the bpd around the river watch Private security yes. contract, so it's, it's it's one thing like to like to, to want to support the police or whatever, but like when like their tax money, my neighbors like tax money are like being used to provide like people's like uh, uh, private security. That's when I, they actually flip. Like I could see like, in their face when like if, if they heard about it, like they would just like yeah, that's not okay. And if they haven't heard about it, I mention it, and they were like, tell me more about that. And so it could be something that's useful in like convincing or like trying to like change uh, change minds. Um, and yeah, Ward Five is also pretty tough. Everybody there's like in on on edge. I uh, I'm a member of a union. Like I know like the union I'm a member of actually is the, the, the IWW. We invented what's called the wildcat strikes uh, or quiet quitting. Now like the, the kids call it or like slow down. That's what it looks like to me. It's like it feels like what the Burlington Police Officers Association is doing as quiet quitting. It's, it's like actually like creating this narrative that's being propagated in the city through the, the administration mostly of like how crime is is out of control. I don't see the police doing that, but I see no, New North End saying. Sure. Well, I mean, honestly, and then I see I see reports like the River Watch contract. I'm just like, how perverse is that? Like, if like you know, like it's like that, then that so more crime would be good for your side gig, right? Like that's I don't I don't want to like I I can't think that I live in a city where that happens. Like I hope that is not true, but it also wouldn't surprise me totally like if that was part of it. I find it odd that I, I feel like I live in the safest part of the city. Yeah. It's the part of the city that bitches the most. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, Lee, 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 Lee you, li you live here in uh, Seven, and you, you said like uh, you, you've heard like some of the more common criticism of Number Seven. So I guess what I'll I'll say I'll just try to keep my opinion out of it. But what I'm what I'm hearing a lot, um, I don't know if it was on Front Porch Forum today, but uh, and I think you know Robert just made a really great point for the New North End is 
the problems that we have in the new north end are different they're different from the old north end they're different from downtown i would say you know what we're dealing up here with for crime i mean just like maybe minor vandalism um yeah so yeah yeah so i'm what i'm so I think that maybe just skews perception, but so one thing that I did hear on Front Porch Forum is um, this, this from this person's perspective is they understand definitely are police capable of really bad things in, in other places? Yes, we see that obviously that's in the news, but this per, from this person's perspective is they, they were not aware of what behavior is happening with the police in Burlington that would justify concern. So, um, I mean, obviously that, that, that does exist, but I think that a lot of times that news maybe doesn't make it up here. So maybe if you could go over those. I, I do, I mean, I, I'm happy to like list it, but I do think it would be useful for the campaign to have a timeline documenting uh, incidents, yeah. So we should we should definitely like I, you know we create like even a special website for it, maybe that goes to that timeline, um, because there is a long history. I've been here, I've been in Burlington in, uh, for 25 years, uh, over 25 years, and I can I can tell you just like the major ones, and also the many 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 times, many many incidents I witnessed that was not documented in the press. Um, so I, I do think there's value in saying like you know and and honestly like even if you live, you live here like longer than i have like sometimes you just never run into these things you know and i have a special interest as a person of color like to like to know these things because it has something to do with my survival and uh and my safety so i do pay closer attention and i and i'm like i i feel privileged that uh, that i've you know i haven't actually been like violated in any ways by by the cops uh, although I have witnessed plenty of treatment. It's not just people of color, it's also people who are homeless, people who are struggling with mental health, uh, poor people. Uh, I think, you know, that's for me, like the number seven, the, quest, the real question is, do black lives matter? Do we believe victims? Do we think homeless people have the same dignity as people who are housed? That's the real question. Uh, as far as like the legality and the, the process stuff, it's it it has been it has been vetted by like by the city council. Uh, one thing like that I that I will mention, Joan Shannon in her criticism of uh, Proposition Zero, which is question eight, uh, said that if Proposition Zero pass, that if we had referendum and initiative, it will produce more uh, uh, questions like the CCP. Uh, because I think the reason she's, she's saying that because it puts a lot of fear into people. There's a lot of reaction against the, this police control board. But uh, by applying that to Proposition Zero, uh, she is kind of tying the two questions. Like I don't know. I don't mind like if that people would think that. But I do think it's important to realize the way uh, pro uh, the question seven started. It originated in the council. The council charter commission actually created that first language, um, and then it was passed by the city council, and then it was vetoed by the mayor. So we had nothing to do with that. Like, I mean, like Proposition Zero, we didn't. We, we actually wanted them to just straight up go to petition instead of the city council, but. In, in many ways, I'm glad that they didn't listen to me when, when they were like starting because this is like because this this, this is like important to, to see what the process and to say, to see how uh, they have followed the process and this is the right process. They they started with the city council and you know and what it what uh, question seven is more appropriately compared to is a referendum. It's not an initiative. Like it's, it's a referendum in that now, like the voters are trying to override the mayor after he overrode the, the council vote. So, just the, the 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 fact that Joan Shannon, who's like who's supposed to be the councilor who does her homework, right, like is saying that it's either like she hasn't done her homework or there's some other, you know, purpose in like in, in confusing the public. And I, I think that's very unfortunate. Um, if if our rule, like people who are making the rules like don't actually follow the rules or are not, don't know what the rules are, and that's a big big concern to me. Um, Tyler, cool. Yeah. So I I know I'm like kind of preaching to the choir here, but I think the question about like 
what incidents are there is really important and important for like all of us to know how to respond to that. Um, and yeah, so for one, like within the past decade or less, the city has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on lawsuits related to excessive force lawsuits and payouts for to, to get officers to resign. Um, on the website, peopleforpoliceaccountability.com, there is a timeline that includes events of like how this proposal has moved through, but also police related events, like excessive uses of force and, and other scandals with police chiefs. Um, so that's a great resource. Um, but sp some specific examples from recent years, which we heard named over and over and over again in 2020 with the Battery Park movement protests where um, Officer Jason Belevance, Joseph Coro, who's the um, vice president of the police union now, um, and Corey Campbell. Um, and so if you haven't, there, there's public videos of those three officers. Um, two of them involve like life altering injuries to black members of our community. One of them involves um, a man being killed by an officer um, with like escalation that was caused by the officer. And, and so all three of these have, or, or there's like three or four videos that you can go view on YouTube posted by a VT digger of body cam footage. Definitely encourage people to watch them because it, it's, it, it makes the issue really clear and these are from recent years and would encourage if, if people are asking, uh, they're hard to watch, but pe people need to see it. Um, and yeah, one of those, Jason Belevance, after cries of the protests, you know, and the city realized we can't do anything, only the police chief is able to do anything about this, paid him $300,000 to resign. Um, so yeah, I know a lot of you know about these already, but. I wonder if uh, we should create just like how when people say, you know, like Prop Zero is just like California, like we get so tired of saying, no, we're more like Vermont. Uh, so you go to this website, everyone but Burlington.com. So then people can see like what we're talking about. We, we compare that we have a list of the charters for every town. I wonder if we could do the same for like BurlingtonPoliceViolence.com. So then like when we come across these questions, like just go to BurlingtonPoliceViolence.com. You'll, you'll see the whole list with video and links to like to the incident. To the yeah, so. right. Yeah, we, we could link them on our we website should, and just yeah, we put warnings. Totally that. like, that's yeah. something that's easy to remember for us to give out. It's like, just go to BurlingtonPoliceViolence.com. You know? I, I, I've seen the videos, the Bell Vance one, that was an assault, yeah. a real yeah. a nasty assault. Yeah, yeah, horrible. I've seen the one, the hospital one, yeah. at least with the- Doug Kilburn, yeah. That with yeah. Then yeah. I did see the video that the, the guy that was up in the uh, Cathedral Square. Yeah, Phil uh, Grennan. Yeah. That, would, that would move out. Would yeah. be, I, was like, I didn't see that one. That footage, was, yeah. um, I saw those, yeah. but I... Uh, um, they, uh, one thing, like, I wish, like, we could obtain this uh, footage is when they, when they uh, injected this kid who was... Uh, oh, that's... Uh, you know, who's like, who's like, who's, you know, he's special need kids. Uh, you know, stole some vapes from like a from a gas station, and his mom called the cops to kind of teach him a lesson what's right and wrong. The cops showed up, and the kids was defiant. Like it's actually just a special need kids, and it, they ended up injecting. I don't know if you you heard about this. Like they actually injected the kids with ketamine, and mm -hmm. it was like it, it was you know I I, don't, I remember Infinite was like uh, kind of uh, was one of the people first people who found out, and he was trying to like help the family. Like there was nothing uh, in the media about it until Murad was uh, getting uh, confirmation and this was brought up and that's like when the media actually like, oh, okay, now we're gonna like look into this story. Uh, I just messed up. I mean, like where, it, it, you know, how are we gonna, how can we trust them? <laughs> it, it, I think it is, it, is, it is useful to like have, like not that, you know, like I have like a you know, fetish for this that kind of thing, but like it's like, like I said, it's like it, it concerns me because you know, like I do walk, I do wonder if like I'm, I'm gonna be a targeted someday, um, just because of who I am, so. <laughs> yeah, can I add just one more thing yeah. to that question that I think is really important for New North Enders to understand. If you go to like the BPD's publicly available data, um, the vast majority of police interactions and arrest and uses of force happen downtown. You know, those interactions aren't happening much up here. It makes sense that people up here are like, what What do you mean? Like, we we hardly <laughs> see the police, you know, because- the, the guy with the shovel, that was up in the- 
Okay, yeah, yeah, there's definitely some, um, but yeah, you'd like open up the map of all the incidents and it's it's all downtown. It's, you know, Old North End and downtown is where where the interactions are happening. Um, and so that that's who's experiencing this and yeah. So the other common uh, thing I hear um, from the New North Enders is concerns that this is a board that will just carry out an anti-cop agenda and also that um, how people will be selected and that it will just be a, a board of people with a, a bias against um, police. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, sorry, what was the, the first part of that again was? Anti-cop agenda. Yeah, anti, yeah, yeah. so, <laughs> yeah. One thing that's really important to understand, and this is part of the, the kind of narrative that's being pushed against the proposal right now is that it takes away due process and that kind of thing. And, you know, if that's the information you're being fed, then, like, of course, it's easy to believe that this is just going to be a board that's there to be anti cop and punish people for no reason. Um, it is absolutely 100% not the case. The standards for, you know, what, what can be disciplined and due process are taken directly from the existing disciplinary process in the charter. So the, the language that um, outlines disciplinary authority for the police chief, um, we just copied that and put that due process, just cause language into the authority of the board. Um, and so the, in order for the board to make disciplinary decisions, there has to be due process, there has to be just cause for their decisions, and the, their decisions can be a, appealed and taken to Vermont Superior Court. Um. So, I guess, you know, and that's a point that, even as someone who's interested in, in this, I've been maybe unaware of is how a disciplinary event gets initiated. Can it just be let's say the, the board gets convened, can they just say like, uh, you know, we've like heard a lot of chatter about this one officer or does there have to be like a, like an incident that's reported? Yeah, so it's, it's cases of misconduct. Um, and so by default, disciplinary decisions would still, like if the board did not take up a misconduct case, it still goes through the police department and the chief. Um, but the board can take up a case and conduct its own investigation, make its own decision on that. Um, but yeah, so they can't just like, I mean, they, they have transparency into police department records and that kind of thing, um, but they are ad adjudicating complaints um, and, and cases of misconduct. I, so, I have something to, so I have something to add that I just rec uh, recently uh, I found out about, uh, and this has to do with the grievance procedure. And this uh, one of the arguments uh, that we've heard is how this will affect all the city unions uh, if this was to to be passed by the voters. And uh, in that, like the ASME 1343, for example, they would lose their union rights, uh, their grievance rights. But what I just found out today is the way it's set up. The police department actually is unique in the city in that the police commission. Uh, is involved in the grievance process. That is not the case with the Department of Public Works, uh, you know, Parks and Recs, who also have other commissions. They are not part of this grievance uh, procedure. And uh, whereas for the cops, they, the police commission act as an arbitrator uh, uh, when there is a grievance being brought by the cops union, uh, you know, against management or against the city. And so it's one thing that has been identified by uh, a few uh, commissioners and uh, former commissioners as uh, as an irregularity that prevents them from that actually uh, handicaps them from like doing uh, doing the oversight that's needed. Uh, this is a, a unique setup with just the police department that is not uh, the case with all the other unions in the city. So I think when you know when when that argument comes up, it's like we, we gotta really pay attention because. Um, you know, it, it just appeals to like people's uh, solidarity, sense of solidarity with labor union, and and that is not the case. I mean, police is not really a labor union. They have a, they are a fraternal order, order. Even like even the FOP themselves will say we are not a union. <laughs> they are a fraternal order, 
And really, the way I think about it, they were, huh? They, no, they have, just because you have a, a, a CBA, collective bargaining agreement, doesn't make you a union. Unions don't kill working class people. Unions don't defend the boss's interest against. But, uh, but just because they're a union doesn't mean that they're a good union. They're not, well, they're not. I, I, they, they, you know what? They, they, they should be considered as a field auxiliary of the Burlington Business Association or the Chambers of Commerce. That's where they actually belong, not not as a union like the, the AFSCME or the firefighters. They, they, would, <laughs> they would claim that they represent. Sure. They, yeah, they, that, that, that's right. They, so they represent the police, and the police is not the labor movement. They have always been at the forefront of crushing the labor movement. Like, let's not let's not like fall for that false sympathy. Like yeah, they. No, I'm, not, I'm not saying a false. It's not, What's that? Sympathizing. Legally, they have collective bargaining agreement. Like that is like the like the term union isn't really. Yeah. No. There's. It's, it's, it's not really, I mean, like, the legal definition of a union there isn't really, it's like it's somebody who's, like, uh, collectively bargained. Like, and that could be, like, anything. That could be the sergeant association or, like, it, 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 so it, which is a management association. That's considered, like, a union, like, union laws apply to them. But there's not really a legal definition of a union. I mean, it's kind of like a union for Wall Street bankers. Exactly. <laughs> so exactly. And, and, but we call that business, like, we call that chambers of commerce usually, not, not a union. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think, like, a really important distinction like you can't loop the police in with all these other different kinds of labor because the yeah. police have the unique authority to use force <laughs> right. to right. so I'm totally people agree. in prison. Yeah. No, 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 I know. Yeah, yeah totally. But I, I think yeah. when, the, you know. It's that because of that union that they're preventing us from firing bad cops. And, uh, um, and the I, charter. And, the charter. and I yeah. feel yeah. as a uh, uh, living in this town for 22 years and paying my minuscule taxes that I pay, uh, um, but I, I still feel that uh, I'm part of the employer. And when an employee is just doing a really awful job for us as the employer, yeah. we should fire them. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know how many workers kill their employers regularly. Like, I, I, I think this is a special situation, right? Like, they could get, get killed, like, <laughs> kill the, em the employer and get away with it. So, uh, anybody wants to? Say something. Can we just say something quickly about Proposition Zero? Anybody is opposed to uh, more power for the people? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm biased. I'm, I'm biased. <laughs> yeah, please. Okay. <laughs> Robert can find something though. Like, so right? the, like, I <laughs> the most <laughs> common <laughs> opposition I hear is that uh, representative democracy serves the purpose of vetting things before they go to the legislature, and the common concern I'm hearing is that uh, uh, anybody with money is going to start to push things towards the legislature. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, that's a valid concern. Uh, actually, money in politics is why I got involved with Proposition Zero to begin with. That's already happening. Uh, there is a lot of money already going into our political process. Uh, if, if you remember, the mayor pioneered the use of PAC money to pass ballot items. They, already, they could already do that through the city council. Um, we, can, we can guarantee you Prop Zero is totally grassroots events, uh, 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 movement. Uh, uh, I do think uh, Winooski, we could like look at Winooski and t take some of their examples. They have put guardrails in the petitioning process, so before we even go out and collect these petitions, you register. You basically go to register with the city first. You, you sign an affidavit certifying that you are a Burlingtonian and like you're not being paid by anybody. So this is the, the this is the kind of things we like to see uh, proposed by the city council. And since they're they're actually not they don't want this at all. Um, I don't think direct democracy is in opposition to representative democracy. If anything, without direct democracy, we won't have representative democracy because I, I don't get it how, how they think we are, we are smart enough to elect one of them to make the decisions, but not smart enough to like, read, like, uh, read the ballot questions. Uh, I don't buy that. I think actually direct democracy is the way to strengthen representative democracy uh, and in that we provide checks and balances. Um, we, we, we're not even starting with recalls yet, like that's coming down the pipe, but I do, I do, I do think that's like a false, uh, you know, like distinction. I, I, it's, it, we, it, it's needed, I, I feel like the direct democracy is needed to check and balance the, the representative. And 
I don't think Burlington has representative democracy. Like, you know, it's like I would be interested in hearing like what ideas about what, how we can increase the turnout. To me, like, if you want to be representative, you should reflect like the composition of the voters. Um, most of Burlingtonians are either homesteaders, you know, of a single family uh, home uh, owners or renters, like the vast majority. Whereas on the city council, we have business owners and uh, landlords and like very few renters. Maybe there's two there, uh, two renters. Whereas Burlington, at, at least 60% renters. Something is not, rep you know, it's not, it's not representative. If, if we look at the back economic background and economic interest, it's not really. The renters still get to vote. They should, yeah, but, but they yeah. Get to vote. They have to, they, yeah. So if they are citizens and they are residents uh, of the city. Yeah, they get to vote. I ab absolutely. They, they like who they want. Yeah. So, but like, let's not let's not forget. Like, most people can't. Like, you know, most people can't afford to really pay attention and or even you know, let alone run for office. There's like there's there's a bias there for people who have a lot of time and not you know like you don't see you know like people with families like actually like in steering committees of the NPAs because usually it's. People with extra time in their hand, right? Like so, it's the same kind of like. I would, I would like be interested to hear like what ideas we have to actually increase the turnout. I mean, I grew up in a country where 95% turnout is the nor is, is low, you know. And I know like Australia uh, as a country, like they instituted, well, they, they so they actually like they won't give you your tax return unless unless you can show them that you voted and like. I don't know if that's that's like that's a little heavy heavy handed, but like I, I see like the value in that. So maybe at some point we should like you know we should sit down and figure out how like to increase like participation. We I guess we gotta pay everybody a livable wage, gotta like, provide health care and child care. It's <laughs> right like so uh, anyways, well thank you for, for coming here. Thank you, CCTV. Um, please take some food home. Like that's, <laughs> there's a lot of food. <laughs> um, Thank you, Robert and Martha, for sticking around. Well, well welcome to the welcome to Word Seven. Well, thank you. I mean, this is the most welcome I felt. Oh, <laughs>